Hey guys, what's up? Thank you so much for tuning in today here at Elevate Church. We know that today's message is going to rock your world and elevate your life to the next level. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the message. Well, how many know that it took a lot of compassion for a, a guy like Dr. Martin Luther King to do what he did? Because just think about this. We, we see, the, we see the, 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 the end result of his, of his obedience and, his, and his, his, his drive and his passion. But I bet many of us probably didn't see the things that were in the dark. Moments where he fell alone. Moments when he was being rejected, pushed back. Moments where people were, were, were being violent, not only towards him, but when he was seen because of this movement that he wanted because God gave him a dream. People being beat and, and murdered and, 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 and women being raped and, and children being separated and all this chaos. Can you only imagine how much pain and suffering and sacrifice this one man was willing and able to do because he was willing to cooperate with God? It takes a compassionate person to do that. But one thing I think that we all forget, that compassion is a mixed drink. It's mixed with, with suffering. It's mixed with challenge. It's, it's mixed with setbacks. Uh, when you decide to be compassionate, it's, it's mixed with pain. It's, it's mixed up with a lot of difficulties that you and I don't like to even deal with. But the reality, there is no such thing to be a person of compassion without having a little bit of pushback. You can't say I'm a compassionate person and not love ugly. You can't love you can't say, God, I want to grow in my love walk. Be careful what you pray for because God will send you every ugly person that don't love you. Yeah, it's called long suffering. Love, he says, love suffers long. Love suffering. Compassion. You can't be compassionate until you get your hands dirty. You can't even think that you're compassionate until you start doing things that literally are out of your character and you start doing things that make you feel uncomfortable. That's the state of the union today. Things that make you feel uncomfortable, but you know that God is calling you to do something that's so much greater than you right now. Are you here today? Are you listening? Please listen today because I'm not playing around. This is a state of the union address for Elevate Church. This is not a typical service, a typical sermon today. God is speaking to elevate church. God is saying it's time to elevate every single one of our lives. It's time to elevate our family. It's time to elevate our children. It's time to elevate God's dream. And how many know that you, though, though Dr. Martin Luther King had a dream, you and I were God's dream to begin with. Look at your neighbor and say, you're God's dream. And then here's what I want you to do, okay? Work with me. Work with me today, okay? Look at a neighbor and just, just say, here's looking at you, kid. And if that person didn't smile at you, just tell them, don't worry, you'll get fixed in a minute. <laughs> Say, I'm God's dream. Look at this. Jude 22. Only one chapter. If you're looking for a verse, there is none. It's just one chapter. <laughs> and of some have what? Yeah. Let's read this together, the whole verse. Ready? One, two, three. And of some have... One more time. One, two, three. Say making a difference. That's what God is trying to speak to the church of 2019. Make a difference. There is so much corruption. There is so much division. There is so much separation. There is so much of this broken society that God is saying, church, have compassion and make a difference. Compassion is making a difference. If you're not making a difference, then you're not being compassionate. We must be compassionate in making a difference. And it's that compassion that's going to change our world. Amen. Do you believe that? And uh, if, you're going to, if you're going to have compassion, if you're going to make a difference, listen, you must have a blueprint for your life. You have to. You must have a dream in your heart. 
you must have a vision for your life. Not only that, you must have a legacy that you're living in this life. You must, you must, if you're going to make a difference, you must have a blueprint, a vision, a dream, a legacy for your life. You must. It is not an option with God. Think about it. God had a dream. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. We sang that song, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God had a dream, and you're that dream. Let me give you a, a, a point. Number one, ready? If you want to make a difference, you must have a finish line. Everybody say finish line. Okay. You can't think that you have a vision for your life and there's no finish line. I mean, just think about the, the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul, when he was given a vision from God, it was, it was mixed in with compassion, but also mixed up with a lot of pain and suffering. But Paul didn't focus so much on the pain and suffering. Paul focused more on the finish line than anything else. Look at what, what, what he said. He said in 1 Corinthians 9.26, he says, So I do not run like someone who doesn't run toward the finish line. In other words, the Apostle Paul said, I'm not running my life aimlessly. I'm not running around sucking up all the sun of my morning, sucking up all the air of the day. I'm not just eating and, and living for pleasure and entertainment. He said, I'm living with a divine dream, with a divine vision, with a divine legacy. I have a finish line for this life. Mom, Dad, do you have a finish line? Grandparents, do you have a finish line? Some of you right here, you're at your 70s, 80s. Stop thinking that I'm too old or my body, ouch, hurts too much. You must have a finish line. You must hear, well done, good and faithful servant. And you young person sitting in here who is constantly troubled with doubts and fears, you have to begin to look with the end in mind and not your current status. It's so easy to be distracted with life. It's so easy to be distracted with this world that no wonder we don't have a finish line. We're too consumed with us. There's no finish line. There's only every single day just dealing with your anxiety, your depression. And I'm listen, I'm compassionate towards people like that. But at some point, we have to rise up again. Jesus said, it is finished. Jesus had a finish line. He said, for it was the joy that was set before me, I endured the cross. The only way you're going to endure this life is when you start looking for a finish line. Every single one of you, what's your finish line? Business owner, what's your finish line? And is, is Jesus in that finish line? God had a, he has a finish line. It's called heaven. Many times we think, oh, man, that sucks. They died. No, they didn't die. You're dying. They're living now for eternity. So death is never your end. Death is your beginning of now living forever. What a finish line God had for us. But how many people really believe that? Okay, three amens. All right, praise God. That works. Three people are going to heaven today. Praise Jesus. Okay. You got to have a finish line. Young people, you need a finish line. People that are already in their mids, you need a finish line. Maybe you've been running around aimlessly. Maybe you've been beating the air, think you're in a fight, just fighting your own shadow. But what's the finish line? How will you end this life? How will you live this life? What will you leave? For your family in this life that they can go ahead and continue to proceed everything that you left in this life and I'm not talking about materials I'm talking about what you pour into them how you touch them say I need my finish line you gotta have a finish line but it, it's, it's difficult when, when you start having a God dream it's it's challenging. It's not an easy thing. 
it, uh, making a difference is ugly, man. You know why? Because people are involved. Take the person out. Man, it's just, life's good. Bring people in. Dang, it's jacked up. It's like the church. This church was perfect until we all came in it. Then we ruined it all. Right? Because we're so imperfect. But how many know that God perfects our imperfections? You know why? Because he has a finish line with your life too. God is working out the stuff inside of you but you have to cooperate when God says I have a dream for you you have to you have to literally be there and be like God I want what you want for my life I desire who you want me to be in this life Mark, Dr. Martin Luther King, he was very clean. He says, I, I, I've been to the mountaintop. He saw the finish line. Though he said, I may not get there with you, but he saw the finish line. He had a finish line. Do you have a finish line? Or are you just so consumed with you right now, you can't even think about even a weak finish line? Let's get a finish line in our life. Let me give you a quick definition of legacy. Legacy is simply this is every life you touch. Legacy is every life you touch. Legacy is every life I touch. That's all legacy is. It's every life I touch, past tense, and every life I will touch, present tense. That's when you start living legacy. Whether you're living legacy here at Elevate Church right now, if you call this place your home, I know many of you, I know Ari, Ari has touched many lives in this church, whether it's been directly or indirectly. Many of you here maybe have not touched anyone's life here at this church, no big deal, but indirectly you have touched someone's life. What do I mean by that? For example, when you think about what we do as a church, as we're going out and we're taking this gospel, not just here in our city, we're taking this gospel into the states, we're taking this gospel into the world, we're preaching the gospel in different places, we're training up pastors. So whether you think you're doing it directly or indirectly, we are all making a difference as God has given this church a dream, a vision, a legacy. He's given something amazing that we are to accomplish together. And so give yourselves a hand clap for helping do that. Every single one of you. For example, when you take the disciples, the disciples had to make a decision. If they were going to make a difference, think about this. Because many times when, when you read your Bible, and it's so easy to do this, it's so easy to read the Bible and, and almost be detached from reality. It's kind of like most people live today because of social media, entertainment. We're so entertained that we are so detached from reality of our life that we live a fantasy. And then we, we wonder why we are so unhappy. The reason we're so unhappy is because fantasy keeps entertaining us. And so when you open the Bible and you start reading these stories, this no longer is so real because everything else is more real for you. But the moment you start reading this with a different perspective, with a shift in your paradigm, when you start looking at this word through, the, when you start reading the scripture and you start talking to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, would you teach me something today? When you take the Holy Spirit serious, he will take you serious and he will begin to reveal and open your eyes again to be able to see the reality of what the disciples did when they were willing to make a difference by giving their life by sacrificing their life think about it they died for the gospel they were martyred they didn't care they didn't care about hearing man if you go into that town they're going to kill you if you preach that gospel they're going to arrest you if you take this word into that community they're going to do some horrible things to you they said i don't care i need to make a difference and today you and i this is this is what this is how i want you to see it peter james john Paul, Timothy, Ruth, Nathan, you can go through all the different people that, that, that were, you know, someone that God used in a big way, but there was also people that, that God used that were really nobodies, but man, they did big things. Like, for example, when they had to bring the Apostle Paul out of a window from the second floor because they were coming to kill him. You know, that was just some girl. Right? How about that guy that had to pray for the Apostle Paul that God would open his eyes? He was just, just some regular disciple hanging around. So it's not about position. It's not about platform. It's not about title. It's about a person who's willing to make a difference with the life God has given them. That's what it's about. 
And so today we get to carry the word. And guess what? Check this out. I know for a fact, read, by reading my word, that the disciples already had a finish line in mind. And they said to us, as Jesus said to them, and that's the beauty about God. God shares his vision with his kids. And they were thinking, well, you know what, guys? Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and put this, let's put this Bible together for them, inspired by the Holy Ghost. Let's begin to write God's vision for their life, for the world. And let's make sure that we're willing to give up everything, time, talent, treasure, anything that we need to do. We're going to do this because we can see that one day there's going to be a church called Elevate in New Hall, California. And the people there are going to be so compassionate and passionate and alive that they can't wait to take this gospel to all the world to the workplace, to their home, wherever they go. They're not afraid. They're, they're willing to do it. Is that, is that who you are? God bless that one person. Free latte today. Free latte right there. Come on, give it up for her. One confident person in the entire State of the Union address. Wow. I'll take that one. Free drink, whatever you want. Donut too. Number two, write this down. If you want to make a difference in this life, get whatever you want in life, but then give it away. I don't want to talk right now. Slow down. Get what you want. Ooh, I like that, Pastor. Woo! I'm going to get her. I'm going to get him. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Loco. Listen. Get everything you want, but then give it away. How many here can use some peace in their life right now? Peace right now in your home. Peace in your marriage. Peace with your children. Lift your hands. Come on, help me out. Remember, it's the state of, state of dress. Come on, help me out. State of the union. Come on. Okay. Then listen, God will give you peace, but then you have to give that peace back to someone else. How many here want joy? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Come on, you get God's joy, you got strength. Man, you got, ah. Okay, great. Once you get your joy, give it away to someone else. Huh? How many here would like to see a financial increase in their life? Come on, somebody. Anybody would like to see that? Woo, hey. Right, yeah, everyone's like, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, guess what? When, you, when you're serious with God, when you know how to honor God, when you know how to bless God, when you know how to believe God, listen, God will give you the finances that you desire, the increase that you want, but, it, but it, it's all dependent on the motivation of your heart because once you get it, you're going to have to give it. Oh, see, we don't like that. Talk about peace. Talk joy. That's, that, that's Christians for you. You don't even talk about money because they get weird. It's amazing. But here's the reality is that, I listen, I want Elevate Church to have more funds so that we can save more children. I want Elevate Church to have more funds to plant more churches. I want Elevate Church to have more funds to do whatever it is that God is calling us to do. For example, right now there's a teacher strike that's happening, right? Okay, we have some educators in our church. So we talked and we said, we're going to figure out a way to give them some finances. We can't pay their, their salaries, but we're going to do something to help them. The church should be the place that it can be an oasis and a support and a help into all the world right that's the church it's not just kind of let's sit back and oh me oh my so i guess what i have to go ahead and say god we need finances to help people in this kind of situation but guess what when we give it okay when we get it we give it and when we give it we get it back it's called it's called the law of sowing and reaping you don't believe in it Stop eating vegetables. Stop eating fruits. Because all that was birthed by a seed. Everything is birthed by a seed. Look at Matthew 7, 2. And with, this, and with the measure you use, and with the measure you what? Use. And with the measure you what? Use. In other words, what's in my measure? Because the measure I use in my life that I'm willing to pour out into someone else's life is the measure you get back to you. 
it will be measured back to you. And how many know that when God measures it back, it never looks like your cup? That's why he says, I will do exceedingly, abundantly, above anything that you ask, think, hope, do, whatever it is. God, you cannot give God. So definitely our measure cups are different. <laughs> Remember, legacy is every life you touch directly or indirectly. Don't you forget that. Think about how does that look like now because I know that people are like, how do you live legacy? I'll tell you how you live legacy. Think about that person that you counseled that was a struggling parent. And they had some great, great children. Like, we've all had them. And, and, and they hit a moment, a season in their life where it got difficult. Their kids were just going just butt wild and just, just disrespectful, bad grades. And you came in and you counseled them. And it was because of that counsel that you gave them. It was a word in season that brought that parent joy again. That's making a difference. It's, it's, it's that person who, who decides to be at the restaurant. And, and though they may have the most horrendous waitress or waiter, that though, though they may be ugly and mean, and even sometimes disturbing, and you're even wondering how in the heck did they get a job in this place? But but you 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 bring it back with with compassion and love and grace. You know what that is? That's making a difference, because you're not returning evil for evil. You're returning good upon evil, and that's not easy to do. Why? Because compassion calls for it. That's compassion. Or every time that you've maybe sat with someone who needed a financial need or needed help with moving or, or needed help with something. I don't know what you guys have done, but think about that. That's making a difference. Or maybe you know someone who was in a, an abusive relationship and, and it was a little crazy, toxic, broken, busted, and you decided to go to that person and say, hey, listen, man, you got to stop that. Get out of that relationship. you got to see the reality and the truth, and all of a sudden that person is able to see again, and they take your godly advice, and they take the love that you display towards them, and they take your counsel, and they do it, and now their life has been changed. You know why? Because you made a difference. That's, that's living a legacy, or every time that that, that you and I together, together, when, when you have given towards the kids that we help in Oaxaca, Mexico, uh, not just Oaxaca, beyond that, but specifically the school, every single time that you have been so generous and thank you for being so loving and compassionate and, and willing to give, you have indirectly, not directly, but indirectly, because many of you have never met the child, but you have indirectly changed that child's life. Because when we first got them, man, they didn't even know how to brush their teeth. They'd never seen a toothbrush. They've never had a, a, a haircut or, or, I mean, they were filled with lice and it was nasty. It was dirty. And you would have these children and, and they had no manners. They didn't know how to use a fork. They didn't know how to use a spoon. They didn't know how to use a knife. They didn't even know how to take a shower properly but then you indirectly you made a difference because you decided to get behind God's dream and because of that we have changed every single one of these child's life now you look at them man they want fashion all the time they're always looking good they want Nikes now they want Adidas it's like what's wrong man be thankful <laughs> hey pastor I like your jacket man, get me my jacket alone what's wrong with you Man, when I met you, I said, what do you want to be in your grub? You had this dull face. Do it again. <laughs> you made a difference. Listen, um, we were with uh, the 11th most powerful woman of the world for two days. Just got back yesterday. And, and she's, 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 this woman walks in a, in a room and, and literally, you, if your hair is undid, like hair number 55 is undone, you will fix it, literally. Like you may not even know her, but she commands this, this respect. And because when she walks in, it's like heaven walked in. She's a born again, saved Christian, loves Jesus, but she's an advocate for child human trafficking or human trafficking, period. And she's been in government and uh, she's on every network, CNN, Fox, uh, Telemundo, na you name it. This woman is just powerful 
But when we were sitting at the table and, 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 and just talking with her, she's the most humble person. You know, what, you know what living a legacy is? Is when someone's able to touch you, even though she already knows we're doing stuff in Oaxaca, her touch was so precious because she just kept like, like cheering us on. Like, wow, man, good for Elevate Church. That is awesome that you guys are changing lives. Man, and just kept like just pom-poms cheering and, and exaggerating everything we're doing. I'm thinking like, do we really do that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking like we got an orphanage with a thousand kids. I mean, that's, that's, listen, that is living a legacy when you touch someone and see something better than they see in themselves. That's living legacy. And as we were sitting there, and this trip was amazing because she said, you know what? I, I love everything your wife and you are doing. And she's gotten to know us and she's seen our life. And she said, you know what? Um, I want you guys to really think about this. I want us to partner together. And I want us to, to, to end human trafficking. And this woman has set up every law that exists now in Mexico on combating human trafficking. She has written all the laws with a fight because she's compassionate. It's been ugly. The cartel has tried to murder her. The cartel is afraid of her. You know what the enemy does? The enemy will confuse your enemy. Or God will confuse your enemy. You know why? Because first they want to kill her. Next thing they don't, they're afraid of her. That's confusion. That's, that's confusion in the camp of the enemy, right? And so, but this woman says, she, when you speak to her, she just says anything to make a difference. She says, I want to end my life knowing that I established 37 orphanages in all of Mexico. Where these children will have a place where they have been rescued and restored. And she said, and you guys will be the first one that we're going to get, we're going to join. And we are, we're part of Zoe. And, 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 but now this woman's like, no, we're going to do this together. We're doing our first conference in May. Um, and it's going to be a movement on human trafficking in Mexico. We're renting out the, the, the Blackberry Stadium. And we're going to go for it, guys. We're going to do it big. And we will see God do big things. But while we were talking, she said, you know what breaks my heart? And we're like, what, what's going on? She said, there's this girl. And she's like, you're not going to believe this. She's in a wheelchair, and she's a paraplegic. She's 20 years old. Her mother was prostituting her for years, every single day. And she said, you know what breaks my heart more? She's like, you think, she's like, that's, that's, the, that's, that's the part that doesn't break you. And I'm thinking, how does that not break you? That's more than enough to break you. She said, no, you know what breaks my heart? is that there's all these organizations out there in Mexico that have a place that we can bring her to, and none of them will accept her. None of them will take her. They'll take everybody else's finances and do everything, but nobody will take this girl because she's a paraplegic, because taking her means a lot of responsibility. The girl cannot be, she can't feed herself, so everyone has to day feed her everything. She can't dress herself, so everyone's got to dress her. She, she wears diapers, so they got to change her diapers. So think about it. When, when you see something Thing that's so overwhelming that you have to be responsible for nobody wants to have compassion see everybody wants to have compassion until you need to have compassion and and i can see her her eyes were welled up and and i'm just like wow it's like looking in the eyes of jesus and so elevate church we're going to partner we're going to figure out how we're going to make sure that this 20 year old girl who's a paraplegic will have a healthy life and she'll have therapists and psychiatrists. I don't even know how it's going to happen, but we're going to make it happen. I don't even know where it's going to come from, but God's going to have to figure it out because that's his girl. And God wants to heal. Amen? That's how we make a difference. Think about it. Just the simple things you do. Every time you invite someone to Christ, you made a difference. Every time you invited someone to church, you made a difference. Say it with me. I can make a difference. I will make a difference. The end. Say it again. That's a paradigm shift of thinking of legacy, isn't it? You got to think different, guys. We all have to think different. When you think about Dr. Martin Luther King, his legacy that he was living and that he left was a legacy of ending racism and segregation. His message was always freedom, equality, justice, and love. Freedom, equality, justice, and love. That was his message of his life. What is your message? What is your finish line? What is it? It has to mean something to you. Touch someone and say, you matter. 
Yes, sin. I'm almost done. Don't worry. <laughs> Y'all tired yet? Don't send me on vacation because then come back filled. It's not, a, it's not about the stuff you leave. It's about how you use your work. It's about how you use your talent. It's about how you use your finances. It's about how you use your giftings that will become an expression of God's compassion. It will become an expression of legacy when people see you use everything God gave you for his glory. But when you're only using it for you, that's selfish ambition. It's selfish love. It's selfish, and we have to change. We have to express legacy. We can change your life by over-exaggerating someone. Just when, when I was telling the ADM, when Pastor Anthony, man, Pastor Anthony can bring you candy, man. Like, man like, he, starts hitting those, he starts hitting the notes, man. I'm like, I'm right there with him, man. I'm just like, yeah. <laughs> but when he came to Elevate Church, he was only 19 years old. He's married now with uh, two kids and, uh, and, and loves his family, loves, loves God, loves, loves his family. But when he first got here, he was just a kid with, with honestly no clear direction. He was just a great kid, 19 years old, like most 19-year-olds. Lack of purpose, lack of vision. Lack of, you look at him today, let me tell you something. You sometimes have to over-exaggerate someone's maybe, maybe, they're, maybe they suck. <laughs> maybe they can't say things properly. Maybe they, they just they don't know how to say it. Maybe every time they open their mouth, it's like, oh, man, they're talking again. I don't know. <laughs> But you can take a person like that and you can make a difference and say, you know what? Man, you're, you're the most intelligent person I know. You're the most gifted, anointed person. You know what? You, there's so much more. Every time you talk, I just, I just I sense the love of God. When you learn how to find the pearl in people's lives, now you are making a difference. It's easy to find the crap. I can find the dirt in anybody. But listen, but you make a difference when you look for the pearls. Look for the pros in people because anybody can find crap. Anyone. We all got mud. Everybody here. But instead of looking for mud, how about looking for the pros in people's lives? Over-exaggerate them. You're amazing. You're incredible. And I'm, I'm telling you, that'll change, that, that'll, that'll change your life by bringing out the best in people, by seeing the potential in them, by, by bringing the potential out of them. You can, you can challenge people. You can challenge people to be a better father, better mother, better uh, spouse, a, a better son, a better daughter. Come on, you can challenge people. Some of you young people, you hear your friends and they talk crap about their parents and you're like, <laughs> yeah. No, don't, 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 don't do that. You know, I was a kid. Hello, I know what we do. You know, but grow up and say, you know what, nah, man, let's stop talking. Some of you older people, man, come on. You're still at work gossiping and slandering and talking about the, the employee, the worker you have, and how you don't like the boss. And how, how about just make a difference? Say, you know what, guys, how about today we all zip our lip? If we have nothing good to say, how about we just be quiet? Or let's find the pearl in that ugly person, huh? Right? Because we, we know they suck. But we suck too. Like, what if you turn it back on you like, ha, ha, we all suck. I mean, that would just, just imagine what would happen in that room when you say, I suck, you, we all suck. It's like, Dan, you know, you're right, we do suck. But guess what? But then, but then, because, because a soft answer will turn away wrath. But a harsh word, the Bible says, will give you a punch. Read your Bible, it's in there. I ain't lying to you. Number three. If you want to make a difference, you have to have a sense of humor. Stop taking yourself so serious. Look at the person next to you. Tell them, you know what? Don't be so serious. <laughs> and, and if they're like, if they're like all like Fuji face, <laughs> just, just be like this. Like, you may think you ain't taking yourself too serious, but tell your face. <laughs> I do. And listen, my staff is here. Do I train you guys and teach you guys to have a good expression? Yes or no? Yes. 
you, you, you know, and they did. They, they, and they all do. They're all wonderful expressors. You know, they're, they're not perfect, but they're wonderful expressors. Why? Because there's something about a smile that can make a difference in someone's day. Just smile. Let's all smile together. Ready? One, two, three. Everybody smile. Heaven's taking your picture. Go. <laughs> Have a sense of humor. It's the ability to laugh at yourself. You did something stupid. <laughs> I was, <laughs> man, I'm just so goofy. Man. Have you ever done anything stupid? Have you ever said anything stupid? Have you ever looked at something stupid? All right. Well, you have the ability to be stupid. <laughs> Don't speak that over my life. Okay, but you're still. No, just kidding. You're not. Don't say it. You're not. You're not. You is smart. You is intelligent. <laughs> What's the other one? You is kind. <laughs> No, listen, we all have the ability to be goofy sometimes. But you have to have a sense of humor. Like, just laugh. Like, ha. Huh. I mean, let's take the example David. David David was this scrawny little redhead kid with freckles and, and, and just thought he was all that a bag of tortillas and chips and... And, and the kid, he had so much god fittance because he, he was a, a man after God's own heart. So, man, his, his intimacy with Jesus, with God, was so real. It was legit. It was raw. It was authentic for the millennials. It was, it was so, like, legit, you know. And, and so, so when he's walking, it wasn't that he was walking around with pride. It was that he was walking around knowing who he was in Christ. He knew who he was in God. When you don't know who you are in Christ, you act stupid. You do dumb things. When you know who you are in Christ, nothing moves you. It's like, <laughs> they were talking about you. Yeah, <laughs> and that's hard to do. Think about it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you do an illustration with me. When I say start booing, you just, when I do this, that means go boo. Let's try that real quick. Okay. So here's the story of David. David shows up at the battlefield of Goliath. And he's walking up to the stage, and of course, he's bringing his, his brothers a ham and cheese sandwich that his dad made. He said, go and be the delivery boy. So he was like the, the grub hub of today. And so he's dropping it off. And, and so there's, he's, he's like very intrigued because he sees that there's an opportunity to make a difference. And he's wondering what's going on. And he's like, hey, man, what's happening? What's going on here? And, 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 and then people are like, oh, shut up, David. Get out of here, man. Go, get have you ever felt like you've been rejected or overlooked? Okay, well, David is right there walking, and he sees this big old dude, and he's moving all the, the crowd of the Israelites, and he sees, he's like, dang, that, that boy's big. <laughs> you know, just laughing, just being joyful. David, I mean, you know he was joyful because he danced naked before the Lord, so that, you got to have some joy to do that. <laughs> and so... His brothers are like, what do you want? Get out of here. And he's like, who is this guy? He's like, that's Goliath. And, and everybody had fear. And everybody was shrinking back. And you had Israel being a coward and not willing to fight, not willing to make a difference, not willing to take the dream that God gave them. They were just at the borders of the dream, but they, were, they weren't willing to enter into the dream. And, and so David's like, who's this uncircumcised Philistine that would think to even come against the armies of God? Who does this fool think he is to come here and put us down? God gave us a vision. God gave us a dream. God gave us a legacy to, to continue on. Let's go ahead and take this. And all the crowd said, Ooh. man, this guy has nothing on us. God is on our side. God will help us. Man, with God, all things are possible. Come on, we can do this. We can take the land. It belongs to us. That's what your life should look like when you're living a God dream. Because if everyone's yaying you, then you know it's not God, it's you. We don't live for the applause of man. We live for the will of God. And so we know what happens, right? Long story short... David has been anointed by God to be king, but, uh, you know, Samuel had an issue with David, and he had a lot of peanut butter and jealousy going on too much, you know, and just jealous. And, and David is ready to go fight, and so the, the king's like, all right, fine, go take him out. And so David goes out there, and you know God had to tell him how he was going to kill him. 
obviously he's walking by. God must have told him, pick up a rock. And he picked up one rock. How many rocks did he pick up? Five. I'm sure God told him to pick up one, but he's like, picked up four more just in case. <laughs> you know why? Because when God calls you to do something, let me tell you something. God will start with, I qualify you, and then we start second guessing. And so he takes Goliath and he begins to speak the word of God. And he says, man, today in the name of the Lord of my God, you're going down. And he went ahead and he threw that one rock, not five, one rock, and hit him between the eye and the guy fell dead. You know what's interesting about this story? It's not the fact that he killed him. That was the given. It was the fact that he wanted to show all of Israel. He wanted to give all of Israel permission to never shrink back fear ever again in fulfilling a legacy for God. So David goes and he grabs the sword from the grip of Goliath and he says, give me that. And he grabs his big old sword. And what does he do? He chops the head off of Goliath. You know why? Because he was showing Israel, there are some things that you got to cut out in your life if you're ever going to live for the legacy of God. There's attitudes you need to cut out. There's people you need to cut out. There's things, there's sin you need to cut out. There's situations you need to cut out. There are things, and listen, I'm not saying cut out people and be a hater. I'm just saying separate yourself from some people, and you can love them, but love them from afar and wave them from a distance. What are you going to cut? How are you going to live a legacy? You're just going to keep doing your thing? How much longer will you play patty cake church? How much longer will we be a Philly church? We only go to church when we feel like it or when we're in trouble, but we never go because we love him that much. But thank you for coming to church today. Thank you for loving Jesus today. And what you use today in giving back to God, God is going to give back to you tomorrow. He's your strength. Two more points quickly. So you got to have humor. Come on, there's some enemies we got to cut. The enemy of self-ambition, the enemy of pride, the enemy of ego, the enemy of the pointing of the finger, the enemy of you end it, finish the sentence. Number four, if you want to make a difference, you need to be willing to do the unusual. Say, I got to be willing to do the unusual. Jesus showed his disciples that. What do I mean by that? Think about it. You remember when there was a blind man on the road? And he had been blind for a minute. And Jesus is walking by and he hears about him. And, and of course, he's, he's getting Jesus' attention. He says, Jesus, heal me, heal me. And Jesus goes there and he looks at him. Now, Jesus could have literally just done this. Whew, eyes would have been open. Jesus could have just done this. And his eyes would have been healed. Jesus could have just come there and say, open your eyes. And he could have just opened his eyes. But do you know what? When God gives you a dream, when God touches your life, he no longer wants you to live normal. He wants you to live unusual. There's too many normal Christians and not many unusual Christians. And so all of a sudden, the blind man's sitting there waving. Okay, wave it. Just wave your hand, Jesus. I'm waving. But all he hears is this. Hey, what's that noise? <laughs> she said, do you want to see? Yes. And he's hearing more noise. There's a, a picking of dirt, and Jesus is now mixing the dirt. And he's probably like, hey, well, what's that? What? Hey, almost? What are you doing? Do you want to see? Yes. And then he hears the voices. What's he doing with mud? What's he doing with dirt? How dare he spit? Because spitting in those times was unclean. But I believe that Jesus said, my saliva can clean you. Why am I hearing voices saying mud and spit? What's going on? Jesus said, do you want to see? Yes. And he, boom, put the dirt and the mud in his eyes, and he rubbed it all over him. And the guy's like, ah, ah. And then he gave him an action plan. He gave him a finish line. He said, now go to the river and wash. He did it. And 
he can see. We're about to enter a 10-day fast tomorrow. And God is wanting to give us a finish line saying, fast for these next 10 days and watch, you'll be able to see again. Another one was an impediment, um, a man of speech, and he couldn't speak. And, and he was like, ah, ah. And Jesus was like, ah, you need healing. He's, yeah, he can't speak. He can't speak. But, but the man knew who he was. And, and, and Jesus said, you know what, open your mouth. And ah, I'm, thinking, I'm thinking, I'm not hungry. You know, probably thinking, probably something like, what's he going to do? Put something, in, 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 food in my mouth? I'm, I'm not hungry. Maybe he's not understanding me. Have you ever been in a place in your life where you're asking God for something and God's not responding the way you want him to respond? And Jesus does something unusual. Jesus says, open your mouth. The man opens his mouth. Jesus puts his, his hand inside of his mouth and touches his tongue, and he speaks again. Unusual miracles. When you begin to allow God, when you allow yourself, when you give yourself permission to stop trying to act a certain way just to look good because you're afraid what people are going to say because you're a Christian, when you get over the fear of man, then God will begin to do unusual miracles in your life. When you do unusual things for God, God will do supernatural things for you. But it starts with doing, being unusual. Stop trying to do Christianity the same way. How's that working for you? You can keep going the next 10 years and you're still not reading your Bible, still not praying, or maybe you are, but it's here and there. God needs to do something in all of us. I'm talking to everyone here, everyone. How many more sermons do you need to hear how many more messages do we need to hear in podcasts, but we don't change? Unusual. Last point, let's go home. You have to increase the circle of love in your life. What do I mean? Stop being a clicky person. I'm, I, I get so tired of seeing blacks hang out with blacks, whites hang out with whites, Hispanics hang out with Hispanics, Asians hang out with Asians. Like, where is that in the Bible? We are one people. We serve one God. And we all have the same color of blood, and it's red. We need to stop this segregation, this separation, because without even knowing, underlying the enemy will work some things out when you're not open to different styles of people, different different, different uh, ways of people talking. Maybe they don't talk like you talk. Maybe they don't dress like you dress. Maybe they don't have finances the way you have finances. Maybe, maybe they're not the kind of people that we surround ourselves with. But let me tell you something. That's not compassion. That's segregation. That's separation. You know what we need to do as Elevate Church? And I am 2019. I'm going to push this whole church. When I see young people or old people saying, we're going to go out to lunch. Hey, come here. Before you go out to lunch, see those three youngsters right there? Take them with you. And the young people, when I see you out there, we're all going to hang out on Sunday. Okay, great. Find a few older people that look nothing like you. Talk, they'll, they'll teach you something. Listen, the young generation will teach the old generation something as much as the old generation will teach the young generation something. But we have to come together. We must make a difference. We can't be afraid of color, creed, or background. We cannot. That's not compassion. We're going to change that at Elevate Church. It's changing already. It's been a fight for me for eight years. Eight years. People said this will only be a Hispanic church because it's in a 90% Hispanic community. I refuse to believe that. I said, no, this church will have whites and blacks and Asians and Middle Easterns. and Latin. It'll have everything. And it's been a battle. But let me tell you something. If you look at our church now, it's changed. There's every culture starting to come now. Everything. But it's been an eight year battle talking to people confronting people stop thinking like that stop hanging just like that go talk to that person get up go say hi go smile to that person invite that person do something i'm not afraid to talk about it why because if we're going to make a difference then we have to have compassion for all people and a little extra love is invite someone to lunch next time that looks nothing like you 
They may dress weird. That's okay. You're weird in your own way too. God enlarged his circle of love. And he said, for I so love the world that I gave my only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And God said, regardless of how dirty you are, how sinful you are, how broken you are, how busted you are, God said, I have room for you. And then his son said, I'll sacrifice my life for you. If today's message impacted you in any way and you want to help us spread the gospel with a financial gift, text the number below and we know that someone's life will be changed the same way that yours was today.